Good afternoon. On behalf of Professor Satish, who is the chairman of the Devicha Center for Climate Change, I welcome you all to the 14th Jeremy Grantham Lecture on Climate Change. These lectures were started when the Devicha Center for Climate Change was established in January 2009. And among the objectives of this center, in addition to research, mitigation of climate change, and adaptation, we were expected to play a very important role in outreach activities, which includes workshop, training programs, lectures in various places. But the donors of this center, Arjun and Diana Devicha, and the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment, they told us to have at least one annual lecture a public lecture, which will create awareness of climate change and will be widely reported in the press. So we have done this over the last uh, 10 years, and we have managed more than one. So today is the 14th lecture. Just to give you a flavor of the talks that were given earlier, uh, the first talk was on why we disagree with climate change. Professor Mark Hume from uh, University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. The second talk was by Lord Nicholas Stern on climate change, overcoming poverty, and the new industrial revolution. The third was on abrupt climate change by Professor Overbeck from the University of Arizona in the USA. The fourth one was by Professor Stephen Sherwood from the University of New South Wales. He talked about Global warming, old science, new science, and controversies. The fifth was by Professor Stephen Running, University of Montana, USA, on is climate change including the biosphere. The sixth uh, climate change lecture was by Lonnie Thompson, the well-known glaciologist. He talked about global climate change, a perspective from the past climate in the world's highest mountains. The seventh was on solar viability and climate change by Professor Joanna Haig from the Imperial College London, with whom we have close interaction. And the eighth was on high resolution modeling of climate change by Professor Kito from University of Tsukuba in Japan, who talked about monsoon and how monsoon will change in the future. The ninth lecture was by Professor William Booth from Yale University in Connecticut, USA. He talked about Will climate change lead to an abrupt cessation of the Indian monsoon, which was a great concern to many people? The 10th uh, lecture was uh, by Stephen Amstrop from Germany, University of Potsdam, and he talked about new insights from climate science and the future of the Paris Agreement. And this was followed by a lecture last year, the 11th one, by Professor Thomas Stoker from University of Bern uh, in Switzerland. He talked about climate change. Is it too late for Paris, Paris targets? And uh, the other lecture last year was given by Professor V. Ramaswamy, director of the Geophysical Fluidium Laboratory in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. He talked about understanding weather and climate from global to regional scales. And uh, <clears throat> early this year, we had a talk by Professor Jeff Dozier, University of California, Santa Barbara, on thriving in our changing planet. So we now come to the 14th lecture. And if you look at the lectures that have given so far, they cover a wide spectrum of issues related to climate change and were given by eminent scientists all over the world. We cover almost every continent. But so far, we have not got anyone to talk about impact of climate change on food security, which is a very critical issue, both for India and the world. So we were very lucky that Professor David Battisti from the University of Washington in Seattle in the USA agreed to visit us in uh, November and give this talk. So I'll say a few brief words about Professor Battisti. If you want to know more, you can do a Google search and find out all about his achievements. He is right now the Tamaki Endowed Chair of Atmospheric Science at the University of Washington in Seattle. He uh, got his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and his master's and PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle. 
He is also a fellow at the Food Security Institute at Stanford University, and today's talk is related to the work he does with them. And he's a fellow of American Research Society and the American Schools Union. And he's well known for his work, which started with his PhD on the coupled ocean atmosphere system, which has the impact on the Indian monsoon and many other uh, weather and climate anomalies in the world. And two years back, he was elected to give the Stephen Schneider Lecture at the American Geophysical Union in 2016. Now, not only is a great scientist and a wonderful teacher, He's also an activist. So he was a part of the uh, case that was uh, argued in the US Supreme Court, Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the US Environmental Protection Agency, who sued EPA for failure to regulate carbon dioxide emission from motor vehicles as required by the Clean Air Act. In April 2007, almost more than 10 years ago, US Supreme Court asked the agency to review its contention that it has discretion in regulating carbon dioxide. The court found the current rationale for not regulating to be inadequate. So they won the case, but as it often happens, even in India, you can win a court case, but the politicians will not implement it. So right now, we are going through a period in the US where the leadership is not fully uh, in line with what the court has ordered, but we are happy that a court case has been won. So I'm sure at some point in the near future, that court case will be uh, really be implemented. So we are very happy to invite Professor David Battisti to talk about climate change and global food production. David. Uh, thank you for those kind remarks. And uh, it's just a, such a privilege to be here uh, for so many reasons. Uh, it's a great place uh, for science. It's a uh, a uh, spectacular place in terms of the history of understanding the monsoon. Um, when I was in high school, my best friend was from India, and we did everything together. And my first graduate student was from India, and is still one of my closest friends. And I uh, have always just been fascinated with Indian culture and food, and, and uh, it's been really delightful to be here, and, and I really want to thank you all for, for inviting me. Um, Let's see, uh, this particular topic um, is one I've been working on for about 17 years now. I'm the climate scientist on this. I um, know something about agriculture. I grew up on a dairy farm. Um, but I don't know a lot about agricultural economics. And so my colleagues here actually know a lot about that and have worked a lot in, in developing countries over the years. So uh, you know, we're a team together. And I don't pretend to know the economics of agriculture in different countries and they don't pretend to know the climate science, but together we've um, really come to understand each other and in, in the kind of complexities and the richness in this problem and also the opportunities. Um, the, the message I have today, I'm hoping it's not gonna be a, a downer. Most people who listen to my talks on agriculture come away saying, um, how do you get up in the morning? Isn't this depressing? And I, I guess I would turn this around and say, um, well, it is, um, but um, if you don't have a vision of what will happen if you don't do anything, you don't know what's going to happen. And if you have that vision, you can maybe do something about it. And there are opportunities, and I'll talk about just a few of them at the end. Um, but of, of all the things in uh, climate change uh, that worry me, um, food production, let's say, I got this, this you know, food production. Uh, is, is one of the, I think, the most serious one for, in my mind. That and just heat stress, which I talked a little bit about this morning. So let me just um, outline here. There are things that you, know, you really want to know about climate change, and one of them is precipitation. That's a very hard problem. But it turns out, and I was not aware of this until I started working on this particular problem about 10 years ago, that temperature is actually uh, is at least as important. In fact, it's more important uh, when you think about the future than precipitation changes. So in that sense, we actually, as a, as a field, have something to deliver. What the temp, what's the temperature going to be in the future? So I'll talk a little bit about that today. I'll talk about how it affects mean yields everywhere and how it'll affect the volatility of yield production in uh, kind of breadbasket countries in the mid-latitudes, where the yields are highest uh, on the planet today. 
and and then um, talk a little bit about what it means in terms of uh, pest damage. And 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 in each one of these problems, we're biting off a problem that we know that we can actually sort of solve from a science point of view and is hopefully, and I think it is true, that they're quite relevant from a societal point of view. Um, okay, here we go. So motivation, crop yield, heat, and climate change. Uh, just a couple of facts here. The global demand for grain is increasing at 2% per year. Um, that's the same rate of increase in the, as was in the Green Revolution between 1960 and 1980, which was the time of the greatest increases in yields per year, per annum, uh, ever in human history. So this, was, this is what is the, the demand um, for the next 30 years, is 2% per year. Um, it's expected to double, basically, the demand for grain by 2050 due to economic development. That's, as, as, as people um, develop, they tend to shift more to a meat diet, unfortunately. And, um, and that requires just more uh, grain to feed animals because you're high, eating higher up in the food chain. And the second is just increasing population. Another third, uh, basically, is what we're likely to add to the po human uh, population um, in the next 50 years or less. Okay. The global supply of cereals is actually increasing at only about 0.5 to 1% per year, depending on who you talk to. So you can see there's a misfit there. Um, this rate has actually been declining. So the year-to-year -year increase in yields has actually been declining since 1980. And now we're at roughly about a half percent. But let's take the upper number, the 1%, and see what we get. If you say, we have 32 years, basically, to, to um, double the, the global uh, supply of grains, so you take 1% to the 32 power, and you end up 1.37, which is an awful long way from 2. Right? So at the rate we're going, we are going to be off by about a factor of 3 in terms of the increase that we need. <clears throat> OK, so other challenges as well. Up until about 1960, the way you increase global food supply is you increase the land that you use. But there is no more um, high quality land left. So the, the good soil is already in use. If you look at the cropland around the world, it's being degraded at about 1% per year. So we're losing 1% per year of good cropland because of mostly soil and water erosion uh, and, desalin and salinization of the soil. And the climate change is going to be uh, an increasing drag on these yields. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. OK, so precipitation matters. Uh, we can't say a lot about how we're going to change. We, we do expect that, on average, in the subtropics, when I say subtropics, I mean, say, between, say, 15 degrees latitude and 35 degrees latitude. We do expect in those regions precipitation to decrease, although where um, is pretty uncertain across the climate models. Central America is one place where all climate models tell you it's going to decrease. Uh, the changes in precipitation variability, how it changes from one year to the next, that's an even harder problem. Okay, so I'm not going to address those two because they're really difficult. Uh, we can't really say anything... Uh, even in a probabilistic sense right now about precipitation, so I'm just going to leave it set. Okay. Increased carbon dioxide. It's often talked about carbon dioxide as a food for plants. It is a food for plants. Um, there's a whole series of these international, what's called face experiments, uh, where they basically take plants and they flood them with CO2, they keep the climate the same, um, and, and, uh, and they do it under various moisture conditions and fertilizer conditions, et cetera. And pretty much across the board, all of these experiments say if you double CO2, you do nothing to yield, okay? Except for if you're in a greenhouse where there's nothing else competing for this, when, for example, for maize, you can get about a 25% boost in yield if you double CO2, hold everything else fixed, have plenty of water, et cetera. It turns out the only place where CO2 matters is when you're under extreme drought conditions, you get about a 20% boost. But if you're in extreme drought conditions, your yield is already so low that you're really in trouble. So 20% boost on a really low number doesn't help. Okay. <clears throat> Temperature is uh, heat stresses on plants. We'll talk a lot, a lot about that. Um, and you also have, because of increasing temperature, decreasing soil mass moisture just associated with increased evapotranspiration, at least in human-managed places. Okay. Uh, and this already matters in the tropics. Um, actually, the first time I learned about this was from an Indian wheat breeder. Okay. Uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you the data in a second. Um, it'll become increasingly important in the breadbasket countries, though, uh, though. So temperature is a big deal. And we can say something about temperature. So impacts of increasing temperature, 
This is a, a, a plot that's going to show up here. Each dot is going to be the yield that you see over one year. This is in northwest Mexico. It's the home of the Green Revolution for wheat, where wheat yields sort of, were doubled um, by increasing varieties, uh, uh, fertilizer use, pesticide use, and plenty of irrigation. So there's nothing limiting here at all. There's plenty of water, there's too much pesticides, too much herbicides, and plenty of fertilizer. And each one of these dots is going to be a year. And what's on the x-axis here is the temperature, the minimum temperature, that's average over the growing season. And what's on the y-axis is yield. And here you go. You can see what happens. As temperature goes up, yield goes down. These are in managed environments where there's nothing limiting for this crop. So it's only a temperature effect. And if you look at the slope of that line, the slope is for every degree C increase, yield goes down 10%. This is wheat in northwest Mexico. OK. So 10% decrease in yield per degree C increase in temperature, growing temperature. It turns out that the people in, uh, in, north, in northern India have been doing the same thing under controlled environments, and they measure a 15% decrease per degree C increase in controlled environments where nothing else is limited. In the Philippines, you do the same thing in rice, and you get 17% degree C, uh, per, uh, uh, 17 loss per degree C increase. Right, there's nothing limiting here. It's not like that the water, it's a, there's a water stress because it's warmer, there's a drought. This is not it. Right? Everything is perfect for these plants. It's just that as the temperature goes up and you're in the tropics, yield goes down. Okay. Why is actually something that this is not familiar to me. I grew up on a dairy farm in upstate New York. We never worry about temperature. And you'll see why in a second. Um, but when I learned about this, it turns out that this is well known. Um, in fact, breeders have been trying to deal with heat since 1970 with no improvement at all. In almost 50 years, there's been no improvement for heat stress on plants, on crops, on yield, I should say. So why is it the case? Under higher temperature, plants grow faster. So if everything else is there for a plant, you know, nothing else is limited, the plant will just grow faster, but all the grain fills out at the very last third of the life of a plant. And what happens is the plant stops growing sooner. So even if you're growing out the same amount of what's called spikelets that are growing out, basically, um, they stop growing. And so what, ha what they say is, they, is you, you, you reduce grain filling. So the grain doesn't actually fill out. So the amount of the, amount of the mass of grain in a spikelet actually is reduced. The other thing that's true is that the spikelets themselves are less fertile under higher temperatures. So there's less of them growing out in the first place. Then you have, of course, increased water stress, and you have increased respiration. All, all these things are well-known physiological things. And the question then is, which one of these things is more important? Well, when I was talking to the maize breeder for Monsanto, I probably shouldn't mention that word, but I did. <laughs> and I was talking to the maize breeder for Pioneer Seed, which, is a, which used to be the biggest one in the United States. They both said, yes, we measure this in our field stations. We know this is true. We've been trying to deal with this for a long time. And I can't remember which one. One of the persons said, oh, yeah, it's grain filling. Another person said, oh, no, it's respiration. And they, they, both, well, most, they both might be right. Okay? And if that's the case, then we're even more in trouble. Because it means that perhaps, depending on the soil conditions and everything else the varieties are using, that the answer is different, which means you've got to breed for a lot of different things, not just one thing. Okay, but this is actually known. It's not a surprise to the agricultural community. It was a big surprise to me. Okay, so it's important for all crops, but especially true for wheat, rice, soybeans, and maize. Okay, so uh, what, what do you, what, what's this, how does this play out? Um, pretty much every organism has, has, on the planet has a kind of a fitness curve like this in, in biology, where on the x-axis is temperature, and the y-axis is relative yield or fitness in the typical biological curve. So like I have a curve like this, and my optimal temperature is probably about 15. This is a tough place for me from that regard. Um, but you know, beyond which you don't do so well. Okay, so this is what they look like. They look like kind of backwards plank curves. And, um, and there's, good, there's good, basically, based on physical chemistry, there's actually good reason to expect it to look like this. <coughs> okay, and they do look like that. And so basically, the tropics today, we're already beyond the optimal growing season temperature for almost all the major grains in the planet. The only one that we're not is uh, sugar cane which is not great, but it's, it's something that does well under increasing temperature. OK, so that's where we are in the tropics today. We're beyond the optimal temperature. So as I increase temperature, yield just goes down. 
And of course, the tropical temperatures are relatively steady. So I can just kind of figure out what's my rate of temperature increase, and I just keep on going down that curve, and I know how much yield I'm going to get you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. OK, in the mid-latitudes, the, opti the, the optimal uh, temperature is about what the temperature is. So in upstate New York, where I live, that was, the, that was the summertime temperature. It was perfectly optimal. We didn't worry about uh, heat. This is true in France, Ukraine, all of the major grain-producing countries in the mid-latitudes. But in the tropics, in the mid-latitudes, as we go to the future, of course, it's going to warm, so we're going to slide down that curve. So even in the mid-latitudes, as you warm up, yields are going to go down. It's just that it's going to take a while before we see that, because we're at the optimal. And the curve falls over so fast. And it's going to take us a few decades before we start seeing this mean effect, the reduction in mean. OK. so. Um, what do we expect? This is a split the difference emission scenario. So it's not business as usual, but it's not like a utopia. You know, everyone gets together and says, OK, we've got to stop emitting CO2 right now, switch to solar, switch to wind. Really, this is like the split the difference emission scenario. It's basically very similar to what the Paris Protocol was. And it says that basically at the end of this century, it would be about three degrees warmer on a global average. But if you actually look at this map and you say, well, how about your place in space? Where you grow crops, the answer is more like four and a half or five degrees, three plus sorry, sorry, three and a half to four and a half degrees. So basically, split the difference in this stuff. So a little bit of optimism here. We're still looking at about a three to four degree temperature increase over land areas, pretty much everywhere. Okay. Okay. So the pattern is certain, but the amplitude depends on how much greenhouse gas we're going to put in. If you're, if you're a, a, a pessimist and you think it's going to be business as usual, just take this map and multiply by 1.2 and you've got your answer. If you're an optimist and you believe in utopia, just multiply by this map by 0.8 and you got the answer. But that means that you know, you're still looking at somewhere between 3, it, uh, like a utopia scenario, over land, and maybe as high as 6 or 7 if you're a pessimist. Now, the other thing it uh, depends on is the climate sensitivity. Every climate model, given the same exact amount of carbon dioxide, increases a different amount. So you actually end up scaling this pattern. Either you amplify it or you decrease it, depending on the climate model. So a really sensitive climate model, you might multiply this by 1.3 more. Right? So now your worst case scenario is 1.2 times 1.3 times this. Right? So it's a, it's a big change. And, and a really wimpy climate model it doesn't give you much of a response. You multiply this by 0.8. OK. So where does that leave us? Here's France, uh, mid-latitude place. And uh, what's shown here is the summer average growing season anomaly about the mean for the 20th century. So zero is just the average temperature of the growing season for, um, for most grains in France. And um, what you can see is a really cold uh, summer would be about 2 degrees below normal. <coughs> A really warm summer would be about 2 degrees above normal. And then 2003 happens, and it hit 3.6 degrees above normal, which is just about where you expect to be at the end of the century under this split the difference emissions now. So what I did here, um, and actually this is the first meeting I went to uh, with crop breeders. And I went prepared to talk about precipitation. It's all I kind of knew that I thought you cared about. And so I prepared all these slides, and then the first day, the discussion among was all about the breeders, and they were talking about temperature, temperature, temperature. They were thinking, like, what's this about? What's going on here? And my economist friends, who's been writing these papers with me, said, gee, if you could actually kind of give them an idea of uh, if this is a distribution of temperature today, like a, a, a probability distribution, what does it look like in the future? Is it just shifted a little bit, or is it like way out here? And I said, well, that's a simple thing. We've been, we could answer that 40 years ago in our field. And, um, so I went back to my room and I shoveled off all these slides about precipitation and I prepared this plot actually, um, which took me no time. And, uh, and, uh, and what, you, what I did was said, every climate model gives you a different mean temperature change. But let's assume the weather is the same. It's just the weather's acting about a, a, a different mean climate. And I just combined all the climate models I had and I just came up with a new distribution. I renormalized it to the same number of years, 107 years, and I just plotted the distribution. So this is like, saying, what's the likelihood of the temperature at the end of this century, summer growing season temperature in France? And the answer is, I'll show you. So there's 22 climate models, okay, forced by this middle of the road emission scenario. 
And the variability is taken from observations because I don't actually really trust climate models that talk about how the variability in weather is, is going to change. And you end up with this. So on average, the most likely scenario is you, year 2003. We know that. I showed you the map of what the average temperature change is going to be across the models. So it's about three and a half degrees warmer than it is today. And if you take the climate model that gives you the least amount of warming, you add the same weather to it, and you, set, you find out that there actually is one out of 100 uh, summers that actually is cold as a normal summer today. And there's one out of 100 summers that's 10 degrees warmer Celsius, Celsius than today, which puts you about basically in the middle of the Sahara Desert. <clears throat> All right, so there's a probability there because you have weather. This, this one year is different from the next. By the way, if you did this for India or for the Sahel, there would be absolutely no overlap between these two curves because you know, there's, there's not a lot of variability in summertime temperature in the tropics. So there's no overlap. Right? So this plot says the odds of exceeding the highest temperature ever recorded in France, ever recorded in France, the odds of exceeding that at the end of the century are 50-50 any one particular summer. Now, I can show you a zillion of these things, but rather than show you a zillion, I'm just going to show you one map. And that map is just a statement of, given the split the difference emission scenario, oh, well, first this one. What happened in France, 2003? OK, 3.6 degrees above normal is about what you expect in the future. And um, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but this was a, an enormous heat wave, obviously, because it's way off the charts for France. There was a 36% drop in maize yield. In France, uh, that was Italy. In France, 30% decrease in maize and fodder production, 25% decline in fruit harvest, 21% reduction in wheat yields. If this were due to precipitation deficits, this would happen every six years. Because there, there was a little bit of a deficit this year, but it was within one sigma. So basically, this had never, they'd never seen, they'd never had those kind of losses before. This is temperature. This is not precipitation. OK. So by 2100, the years of similar temperature stress on agriculture would be the norm. This is what you should expect throughout the tropics and subtropics due to summer average temperature change. OK, so here's a map. And this map just says, what are the odds that the temperature in summer, growing season, uh, and, and it's actually summer in northern hemisphere and summer in southern hemisphere. So this is them about the equator. What are the odds that your place in space will be warmer than the, temp the highest temperature ever recorded in your place in space? That's what this map is showing you. Anything that's in red is more than 90%. So basically, if you live in the subtropics or the tropics, say between 30 north and 30 south, it's pretty much red. So the odds of exceeding the highest temperature ever recorded, for example, in India is pretty much you know, 90%. Highest temperature ever recorded in India. <coughs> Okay, and that's even if you take a really wimpy climate model that gives you the least amount of warming. And you have a split the difference emissions now. You're not talking about business as usual. Yeah? And so this, these, are, these, are, these are worlds that we have not experienced from an agricultural point of view, not to mention a human point of view. So research from these international research uh, in, institutes on, on food production um, tells you what's going to happen here. If you have uh, enough water, enough fertilizer, enough nutrients, it's a 10% reduction in maize. Uh, that was the number per degree C. 15 in wheat in India, uh, 17 in the Philippines. So every day, one degree C increase, you're looking at sort of a ballpark number of 10% decrease in yield of major grains under otherwise optimal conditions, even if there's plenty of rainfall, right? which of course is not going to be. It's going to be deficits and there's going to be excesses just like there are now. So this is on top of what, we've, what we experienced on a year-to-year -year basis because of precipitation. This is an additional thing that we don't experience today, really. Okay, so that means just moving forward, for the middle of the road emission scenario, you have a 20% decline by 2050 and a 40% decline by the end of the century in yields, global yields. 40% loss in food production, everything else being okay. Okay, so the other thing that's about that, that I didn't realize at the time, so that was published in 2009, we thought, well, that's easy. I mean, this is, this is inescapable, but this is also inescapable, and this is, this is even, in some ways, at least it's because of the problem. 
Okay, so it turns out the volatility of yield actually goes through the roof, even with small temperature changes. Okay, so this is where we, I said we were at in the mid-latitudes today. That's the typical growing season temperature in France or in the breadbasket country in the U.S. or Ukraine or in China. And um, there's variability. There's cold years. There's warm years. That's me measured by the arrow here about the bullseye. So that means due to temperature, we wobble back and forth. But we're always near the optimal. So like growing up in upstate New York, I didn't care about temperature. My grandfather didn't care about temperature. My uncle didn't, you know, growing up on the steric worm. Because we were always wobbling pretty close to the optimal, so we don't see any effects of temperature change. OK, that's great. OK, if you're now two degrees warmer and you have the same weather, which is a pretty good assumption, now you're wobbling back and forth between perfect yields and no yields. Right? So you can see what happens, even with no change in weather, as you move forward in warming, the volatility, the year-to-year -year availability of yield production, yield in the mid-latitudes is going to increase greatly. How great? Okay, so we did, we did some calculations here. Nothing's <laughs> happening. Just so here we go. Um, so here's a cartoon version, then I'll show you some, some real results. This is for Iowa. It's a breadbasket country for uh, producing maize in the U.S. And this is the likelihood of having a yield anomaly about zero, which would be the average yield in Iowa. So that you, yeah, I was actually a little colder than, than the optimal, so a little warmer summer is good, so you get a better yield than the normal. And there's a slight chance you get a yield failure um, due to, due to um, uh, really hot conditions. Okay, That's today. That's planning on May 1st. And so the average temperature near the optimal, there's very little variation in yield. Let's just add two degrees warming to this. Same weather, okay? You end up with an increase in volatility. See what's happening here? It's kind of spread out now. So there's much more likelihood that you're going to get a 20% loss in yield, say. And there's even a likelihood you're going to get a 40% loss in yield. And there's still a little bit of a likelihood you're going to get a better yield, right? Because we're warming up, so we're, getting, we're going over the optimal slightly down the other side. Okay. <laughs> And if you say, oh, I want to avoid the, um, the hot season, and so instead of applying a 120-day variety, which gives me the best yield possible, I'm going to put in 90-day variety, which gives me a little bit less yield uh, than a 120-day variety, but at least I don't have to grow it in August or in September. It turns out it doesn't matter. Not very much. You don't get a big, uh, and that's simply because temperatures maximize at the end of June. And so you're not, you can't avoid that season, because you can't plant in February because the ground is frozen. Okay, so four degrees, it's a crapshoot, right? Anything's possible. There's a slight chance you'll get a normal yield. There's a slight chance you'll get a 50% reduction. It's all over the place. Okay, if you're a farmer anywhere in the mid-latitude, you can't farm anymore under this scenario. It's just not going to happen, right? Especially in the U.S. where farmers aren't worried today about variability one year or the next because there's crop insurance. I don't know, is there crop insurance in India? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, in the U.S., every year we spend $60 billion a year in crop insurance. And, that's, and we don't have very much variability <laughs> uh, in, in yields. And yet here you are talking about basically a crapshoot for your yields. We can't spend, you know, we did some ballpark numbers. You're talking about somewhere on the order of a trillion dollars crop insurance if you want to cover it all. That's not going to happen. Right? So basically people are going to stop paying crop insurance. And how do you run a farm like this? Right? It's, it's not possible. It's, you can't run agriculture in the U.S., China, Russia, Europe, the breadbasket countries in the world. You cannot run it under this kind of volatility. Okay. Not the way we do it today. So how about the other breadbasket countries? So um, we built a model for the, for the world, and it's a two-step process. One is just like it's an empirical model. You can use a crop model if you want to. Um, they also have a lot of empirical stuff in it. Um, linking the current climate or the past climate to the observed yield variability. And then we apply that model to a two degree warmer world and a four degree world world. Okay, compared to what we saw at the end of last century, 1980 to 2015. Step one is building this model. We use the global maize data from 1961 to 2008. And I should say, um, we're doing this now for wheat. It's going to be the same answer. I, I, know, I know that. We don't have to go too far. This. In fact, uh, yeah, I'll show you some results, but I don't think we have time. Um, 
So we have data for annual yield, growing area, area harvested, planting date, harvesting date, irrigation, etc. We have it at a half a degree resolution for the planet. And anywhere a country doesn't produce any more than three, 3 million metric tons, we just ignore it. Um, yep, OK. Then we do a cluster analysis on this yield data to look for common places, common ways um, agriculture seems to work. OK, and I'll show you a plot of that in a second. For the weather data, we use two sources, uh, the observed monthly temperature and precipitation from the crew data set, and we use the ER interim stuff eight times daily so we can calculate things like rowing degree days and killing degree days, if that means something to you. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Okay, and then we built these models. So you can see that the weather data goes from 1979 to 2015, but the crop data only goes from 61 to 2008. So there's a there's a 30-year common period that we, we choose to train the models and to test the models on. Um, you have to move the technology trend because for a lot of this period, the, the, the trends in yields were positive. And that's basically due to technology, particularly in maize. Uh, maize yield has gone up by a factor of over two in, in the mid-latitudes because, not because the plant is more fertile, it's because uh, they figure out how to put more plants on the same area. So when I was a kid, we used to in the summertime after we got all the choice done, we'd go running through the cornfields and like as a maze and we'd try to find each other, you know, and, and it took us forever to do it. But then nowadays, if you look at it, the density of the crop spacing is about four times uh, less than it was when I was a kid. So it's so dense right now and that's where the excess yield's coming. It's just that there's uh, more plant material. So it's actually more, for to, mo more, more photosynthesis for less yield. Right, because there's more biomass being grown, but there's less yield. <clears throat> you know, there's less product, grain production for biomass. Okay, we, we tried a whole bunch of different empirical models, nine in total. Four are more linear, three more nonlinear. Some are fit the logs of yield, some are fit to quadratically to yields. Um, one is fit to relative yield, so we're linking climate to yield. And, and we did three of these in the paper, but we did um, nine overall. Um, seven of the models are based on monthly average in, or seasonally average temperature and precipitation. Uh, one of the models is based on growing and killing degree days plus the growing season average precipitation and we did it, um, we fit that model to yield and another one we fit it to the log yield. There's all sorts of details here that turn out, none of them turn out to be any important. But we tried a lot of things to see how sensitive our empirical models were and they're just not sensitive. <coughs> okay. And then you cross-validate, you know, it's the normal way. So you take 25 years of your data, you train your model, and then you apply it to the next five years of data, and it's just you do that, and you keep on scrambling it in a Monte Carlo sense. Okay, so you can take all of this information on where you grow today. Irrigation, is it irrigated or not? Uh, growing season, mean temperature. And we just did a K cluster analysis on say, what are the common ways people do maize production? And anything that's uh, the same color here is a common way of doing it, basically. Similar yields, for example. Um, so what's a good example? Uh, well, let's see, Europe, France is the same as uh, Iowa. You know, they're both kind of purple here, which fall into category three. And these clusters actually turn out to be the same things as the mega environments that are identified by the agricultural communities in terms of common ways of, of doing maize production. Okay. Step two, you apply that model uh, to a two degree warmer world and a four degree warmer world. And the reason why we pick that is we just, and when I say two degree warmer world, it's not two degrees everywhere, it's two degree global average. So over the land areas, it's more like three, okay? Or over two and a half or so. And then you calculate the robust change in the seasonal cycle. So every model gives you a change in the seasonal cycle. We calculate that pattern for each model. We normalize it so every model has a global average temperature change of one. And then we add all the patterns together. So we come up with a pattern that's common across all models. And then we just scale it. We said, let's make that pattern have a global average of two or a global average of four. Is that okay with everyone? Everyone get that? And when I say pattern, I mean the seasonal cycle. It's the seasonal cycle. And then what we do is we simply just add today's weather to that new mean state. So we just take all the weather from the last 35 years, and then we just increase the growing season temperature by whatever the average is across the models. Okay. okay, so that's what this says here. We have 26 models to do this. 
And um, here's what the pattern looks like. This is the change in the growing season uh, temperature for a two degree average globally warming world. And here's a four degree. And you can see for the land areas, it's more like uh, two or two and a half or three degrees over the land areas where you're growing crops. Um, over India, it's only like one and a half. Um, and then here's what you get for a four degree world. Okay? Now. Then you add the new seasonal cycle to the observed day-to-day -day temperature and precipitation anomalies. And uh, so the sort of the new world, the warmer world, sees the same weather as today, exactly the same weather as today. It's just acting on an overall slightly mean, slightly warmer climate. And when we see this world, so uh, if you look at the range of global climate sensitivities and you look at the business as usual emission scenario, you hit two degrees warming by 2055. So that's 30, less than 30 years from now. Okay, and there's a range here. There's one model that does it as early as 2047. There's one that does it as late as 2059. Uh, in, under this RCP 6.0, to split the emission, split the difference in the emission size, you, you, you hit two degrees by 2080. Okay, so, you know, 60 years from now. Four degrees, you hit it by the end of the century under business as usual, and you, you hit it a long way out if you do the split the emission difference scenario in 2166. Okay, so you can say two degrees, no problem. 2055, maybe 2080 if we're kind of lucky, somewhere in that range. Uh, four degrees, end of the century if we don't do anything, if we just go on business as usual. Okay. This is the average maize yield today around the world. It's uh, greatest in the mid-latitudes, Europe and the US, uh, Argentina. Um, it's low in India. I don't know if you can see the coloring there, but it's more like one, two, three tons per hectare in India. It's simply because it's hot, right? Its yields are low. We know that, okay, from the beginning of the lecture. Um, here's the yield change with a two degree warming and a four degree warming. I always want to point out here that Light purple is anywhere between zero and 20% decrease in the mean yield here. So in this, this map here, you're looking at anywhere between a 10 and 25% decrease in yield for a two degree warming. If you go to four degree warming, you're looking at a 40% decrease in yield in most places. And in particular, in the mid latitudes, like over the US, uh, for Ukraine, China, South Africa, places that grow, have really high yields, so they can grow a lot of grain, a lot of, a lot of maize. Okay, so the two degree C changes are in line with previous regional studies for China, US, and Europe. And there's the references if you want them. Uh, now here's a, a look at countrywide production. So in the US, you're down about 20% for a two degree C increase. Uh, you're down almost 50% for a four degree C increase. S same, similar to numbers across the board. On the order of 20 to, four, 20 to 40%, 50% decrease for a four degree warming world and they were between 10 and 20 for a two degree warming world. So why these four countries? These four countries account for 68% of the world maize distribution and 78% of the world trade in maize, right? So these are, these are big players in maize. And I don't know, uh, I'll describe a little bit about maize and world wheat and maize prices in a second. Um, as now as a measure of how volatile things are, is uh, a measure of the variability divided by the mean. Of course, the mean is going down, we you know that. And what's happening to the variability? Well, from that cartoon I showed you, the variability should be going up. So you expect, in general, the coefficient of variation, how volatile it is compared to the mean, should be increasing both because the mean is going down, and in the middle latitudes anyway, the variability is going up. And that turns out to be the case. <clears throat> so here's the coefficient of variation today. And there's part, there's, there's part of the variability that you see it's not climate related. It's because people are choosing, you know, whatever, to, to plant different varieties, for example. Um, all sorts of things, you know, pests, you, you name it. Um, so in general, you're looking at coefficients of variation of around uh, 20%, um, 0.2, uh, in the present day. And about half of that is due to climate. And the other half of it's due to all, everything non-climate. So the variability in temperature and precipitation you see basically is accounting for about half of the volatility you see in yields today. OK. This is the change in the variability, yield variability, the change in the coefficient of variation for a two-degree warmer world. And um, what shows up here 
is a bunch of oranges in these breadbasket countries <clears throat> that have really high yields to start with. So these orange numbers are anywhere between 1.5 and 2. So basically it's, it's kind of a doubling, up to a doubling in the volatility of yield production um, with just a 2 degree warming world. And with a 4 degree warming world, it's going up by a factor of 4. So the volatility is increasing really rapidly as you go into higher and higher temperatures. Okay, so for a two -fold, uh, up to a two-fold increase in the variability for a two-degree sea warming and a four-fold increase for a four-degree warmer world. Okay, uh, why, is the, why is it happening? The top plot here, each column is for a, left column is for a two-degree warmer world and the right column is for a four-degree. So this is a total change in the coefficient of variation here. The, the numbers are typically... Um, 0.1, so it's going from 0.2 today to 0.3, basically. And um, this is the change in the coefficient of variation because of the change in the mean. So the mean is going down, right? So if I look at the green here and I look at the green here, this is not as green, okay? And if I look here, the change in the coefficient of variation because of the change in the variability. So roughly, for the mid-latitude countries, it's the change in the coefficient of variation is roughly equal between Volatility is increasing, you're going back and forth between larger and larger values, and the mean is going down, and they both contribute equally. You see something interesting when you go into the tropics. Um, volatility increases as well. It's like this green here is like more like uh, 0.5 or so, um, so you're getting about a 5% increase, and um, most of it is coming from the change in the mean, and you can see the change in the, the volatility is actually going down in the tropics. Why is that? Because you get more and more years where you grow nothing. So there's a floor on how volatile it can be because basically there's a lot of years where you get nothing anymore. <coughs> so the, the volatility is going down. It's going down simply because you're not growing anything anymore. All right? <coughs> okay. So an increase in absolute and relative yield variability uh, in, due to increased yield variability and a decrease in the I uh, mean, uh, uh, in, in mid latitude places. Okay, so the year to year yield variability in the six top maize producing countries. So I'm just going to show you these numbers for the six top producing countries for maize in the world. This is what it looks like. So each curve here is the probability of yield about today's normal. So today's normal is always zero in these plots. So let's look at Argentina. So this is the yield today. There's a really high likelihood that basically you're going to get the, you know, like the extremes here, plus or minus 15%. That's like an extreme bad year and extreme good year. As you go to a warmer world, a two degree warmer world, the average yield drops by about oh, 15, 10, 15%. And you can see that the PDF is getting wider, so the volatility is increasing. As you go to four degrees, the yield drops on average even more, and it gets more volatile. And this is true for every one of these countries, every one of the top producing countries in the world. Brazil goes from being very little volatility, high yield, to less yield, more volatility, to even less yield, more volatility. Every country is like this. Right? So average yields go down, variability goes up. Okay, so extreme yield losses are increasingly likely. Okay, so we did a whole bunch of sensitivity studies. Maybe I won't spend any time on this, but uh, the answers are not sensitive to pretty much every approximation we made in this. Okay, you can do things like change the planting date. There's no way around this, really. Okay, um, we don't change, consider any changes in weather um, because precipitation projections are uncertain. Uh, and there's increasing evidence that there will be little change in temperature variability as you go into the future. Okay, all right. So average yields drop everywhere. Mean production declines in the top four producing countries. Uh, responsible for 68 of the world's production and 87% of its exports. Okay, so and these numbers are between 8 and 18% for a two degree warming world, which in metric tons is converted here. So how much does that mean? This means uh, the net reduction of 53 million metric tons, 139 million metric tons. Okay, and for reference, the world production is about a, a thousand million metric tons. So these are pretty big numbers in terms of the reduction. And the world exports 125. So you're talking about a reduction in yields that are bigger than the net exports that countries make today. 
Okay, so the absolute and the relative yield variability increases. Uh, six highly producing countries and mo responsible for most of the world's exports. Uh, what are the odds of these all countries all failing at the same time? Well, today the answer is, what are the odds of the top four producing countries seeing a 10% yield in the same year? The answer is zero. What are the odds of the top four producing countries seeing a 10% reduction in the same year under two degree warming? Well, 6%. What are the odds of the top four producing countries see, seeing uh, less than, uh, uh, greater than 10% reduction for a four degree warming world? And the answer is 90%. So you're talking about not just failure, as you go across the board. So you pick it top four producing, top four exporting, top three exporters, top three importers. Countries that are producing and countries that are exporting are both, are both are, and importing are going to get hammered, right? And they're going to get increasingly hammered at the same time. So what happens when, like say, Ukraine gets hammered and the yields go down? What you do is you, you make it illegal to export. What that means is the price of maize on the international market goes up, right? And it turns out the price, once the price of maize goes up, the price of wheat goes up. Why? Because the two grains are completely interchangeable. If you don't have enough maize to feed your cattle, you use wheat to feed your cattle, right? So, so failure in one of these grains Means, it means increasing prices in one of these grains, not just in the country that you're growing them in, but in the countries you're exporting them to. And it turns out with the so-called transmission coefficient, how, how much the volatility in the international market translates to volatility in the domestic, domestic, domestic market, it's like 0.63. So effectively, once you see the international trade, the tr trading grain increase, the domestic trading grain increases. And so this has huge ramifications for growth, not just for the growing countries here, but for the importing countries, for the exporting countries, and even for any domestic production that are actually not affected by the importers and exports. <coughs> okay, so simultaneous annual deficits for top producing and exporting countries will become the norm. Implications, simultaneous temperature-induced production shocks in large exporting and large importing countries will cause volatility prices in the international markets, and for maize, the price volatility uh, extends to domestic markets. Um, maize accounts for one-third of all the global trade in cereals, and is closely connected to other cereal and oil crops through a vers uh, versatile uh, role in food and animal feed and fuel markets. So the grain and oil crop prices are tightly correlated due to substitutions in production and consumption. <coughs> okay. Let's do quickly pest pressure, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly do this. Uh, we built it. So we're just curious. Like, no one's actually really looked at this. We thought, like, well, like, clearly pests are a problem today. They're a big problem today. Um, something like 25% of the grain that's produced in India is lost due to pests every year. You don't know that besides me, because I read the papers on it. <laughs> uh, in, in, in the mid-latitude countries, it's not, the numbers are typically 8 to 12%. Uh, but like in Africa and India, the, the, the numbers are typically 25% of what's produced is actually lost due to pests. What we did is we, we I, I worked with um, uh, evolutionary biologists on this. This is not my specialty, but I'll tell you what we did. It turns out that metabolism of cold-blooded animals like pests um, uh, scales exponentially with temperature. So if temperature goes up, metabolism goes up. And actually, this is a pretty cool thing, because if you're a physicist, the E is the, is the uh, Boltzmann constant. I mean, like you, that doesn't happen very often in biology. Um, so it's basically metabolism is limited by the rate-limiting enzyme reaction, which is controlled completely by temperature. So if you're an ectotherm, temperature goes up, metabolism goes up. If metabolism goes up, you have two options. You can suffer and die, or you can eat more and live. So there's two parts of this equation. One is metabolism you know is going to increase. And then we, and we hooked that to a population growth model. And we said, like, what's the population fitness? And that goes back to that curve I showed you. I don't know if it's going to pop up here. Yeah, here it is, um, which is measured for ectotherms. This looks like this. There's an optimal temperature for their population biology, um, which is uh, something like below the temperature that you experience here in India today but it's a little bit above the temperature that you experience in the mid-latitudes. So in the mid-latitudes, we're kind of out here, actually. And so with increasing temperature, the population fitness increases, and the bugs are hungrier. So you've got a double whammy here. 
in the tropics, the metabolism goes up, but the population fitness as you increase temperature goes down. So the population of bugs is probably going to go down. All right, so that kind of summarizes it. Um, you can hook these things together. I won't get into it. Uh, you can then, there's only, uh, there's only four coefficients in this model, and the, and the X is only sensitive to one of them, uh, which is nice. And the model is actually tuned not to country to country losses, but it's actually tuned to one number, fractional change, the changes in the, pop, the past numbers, the population numbers. And we already can anticipate what's going to happen here. In the mid latitudes and in the tropics, you increase temperature, metabolism is going to go up in both places. But in the tropics, if you increase temperature, fitness goes down, and so this actually is a negative number. This is a drag on this. So there's going to be some losses, you know, some, some balance in this term because the population declines. But in the mid latitudes, these are going to add together. Okay, they're going to support each other. Okay, so here we go. This is wheat. This is rice and this is maize. And each one of these is showing you the increase in the yield loss due to pests. So it's like, it's starting out saying like, let's say you have today's pest loss, whatever it is. So in India it's about 25%. In Africa it's about 25%. In the US it's about 10%. And you say, how much is that yield loss going to change due to pests? So what this says is that basically if you live in the US and you live in Europe, it's going to double. So if today we lose 10% of our yield to pass in the future, we're going to lose 20%. Okay. And then this is due to a two degree warmer world. Uh, same thing is true in maize um, in the mid latitudes. You notice that the, the yields are not as big in the, um, in the tropics. The yield loss is not, the increase is not as big in the tropics in the mid latitude. And that's simply because the population of bugs goes down. So if you break it down to the, these two components, in, all three grains, wheat, rice, and maize, the metabolic, the metabolic component is, is causing an increase in pest loss. Okay? And in all three grains, basically, uh, the demographic part of it is also causing a loss of yield uh, in the high latitudes and the mid latitudes. And you can see, Freyer, especially in when you get to, to maize here, um, it's negative, actually. So there's actually a decline in the population of bugs. So even though they're hungrier, there's less bugs. And the combined effect means that you, the relative yield loss is smaller. Okay, now, um, okay, good. Okay, so increased loss due to metabolism everywhere. Demographic uh, changes uh, amplify the losses in the mid latitudes and they, they, they mute them in the tropics. And the net percent increase in yield loss is then greatest in wheat and maize in the mid latitudes because the two are effects are combining with each other. Okay, uh, let's look at regionally now. Um, oh, I should, yeah, okay, regionally. So here's for, like, for example, for wheat. Um, these countries now are, um, not all of them are identified. The, the countries that produce the most of that grain in the world are identified by a black circle and labeled. So here, India is the second largest producer of wheat in the world. Okay, so that's got the, a big bubble and a black line around it. Their yields are low in India. Um, this, is, this is the current yield, so it's like about one and a half tons per hectare. It's low compared to, say, France um, or Russia or China. Uh, and the percent change is actually only about 20% increase in pest loss. Now, the, it, whereas if you live in the places that have really high yields, uh, like France or so, the losses are more like 50%, so the increase in loss. But, but don't let this fool you a little bit, because a 50% loss on a 10%, the normal, normal today is 10%. So a 50% increase gives you from 10 to 15% total loss. That's a 5% of total production. A 20% increase in India, starting from a 25% loss already, is a big number, right? It's 10% addition and increase, okay? So here we go. If I did my math right, I don't think I did. But Okay. Uh, here's rice, it's the same story. Here's maize, same story. Really large producing <coughs> countries, France, China, all are looking at like 30% numbers. Okay. 30, 40% numbers. Okay, so large impacts in high yielding, high production countries in the mid latitudes. The greatest absolute yield loss is in the tropics. Even though the relative yield loss changes are small because you're starting from a, such a high loss already, the relative yield losses are actually pretty big. They're biggest in the tropics. Uh, global average losses for these increases, if you just sum up over everything, 
is a is about a 50% increase in the loss due to the pests um, associated with um, per wheat, and 20% for rice and 31% for maize. Okay. So increase in yield loss is probably secondary to implications for pest management. So remember, I'm saying that you start out with 10% of your yield is lost today in the mid latitudes due to pests. So this is actually a kind of a small player compared to the temperature loss we're going to see, right? Um, uh, but, but it also assumes you're going to keep up with the pests by increasing your pesticide loss. And that's probably the more serious problem here. If, you, if you're looking at like a 50% increase in pest problem, you're going to have to put out more pesticide. And of course, the bugs always are always ahead of you when you put out pesticides. They're always mutating by right? finding ways around you. So this is it, saying that basically, if pests are a problem today, they're going to be increasing the problem in the future. And the way we've dealt with them historically is pesticides. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, good. Impact. So here it is. This is summary. Impacts of increased temperature only. So just focus on what we know is going to happen. Temperature is going to increase. Many crops in the tropics and subtropics are already well beyond the output growing range for temperatures. This is pretty much everything except for sorghum and milk okay, that I can think of, which, which yeah, I think you can still withstand a couple of degrees and be at the, be at the optimal. And sugarcane, of course, which is not a grain, but that's one. The impact of that alone is the average yields are reduced about 10% per degree C of warming. The yield reductions of 30 to 40% by 2100 in India and southern Africa and Middle East under otherwise optimal conditions should be expected. Okay. <coughs> by 2050, increased volatility of crop yields in the mid-latitude breadbasket countries. We'll, we'll, we'll see that pretty, in, but that, and we're going we're gonna to start seeing that really quickly. Uh, increased crop losses due to increased pest pressure, roughly a 30% increase of what, what we lose today due to pest um, by 2050. Uh, so that's for this two degree warming world. Loss of arable land due to salinization of groundwater and sea level rise. So we're constantly losing land because of the way we irrigate, salts building up in the, in the ground, sea levels rising in a lot of places. Um, we also have groundwater extraction in a lot of places, including India, which is happening much faster than the replenishing rate. Uh, you have water storage and snowpack for irrigation will decrease. This is a particular problem for the western U.S. where the snowpack basically disappears every year and comes back. I think it's probably less of a problem in the Himalayas simply because you, you, you deliver a lot of snow every year, right? And it comes right back down to you. So the fraction of water coming out the Himalayas off the Himalayas and the rivers is just, the due to glacial melt is small, you know, the, the trend in glacial melt is small compared to the year to year delivery. Okay. Um, decreased nutritional content. When you grow grains in a higher temperature, the protein content goes down. And for reasons why I don't understand, the protein content goes down, plants are more susceptible to diseases and pests, right? Other plants tend to be weaker. Uh, increased disease transmission rates under higher temperatures, you know, usually bacteria, um, viruses do a lot better than, um, than mammals. <clears throat> okay, so what are the options? You can have aggressive mitigation of greenhouse gases. That's not happening. Right? Um, we've got a lunatic for our president right now. Right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, you know, fortunately, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, the system is crashing so fast in the U.S. I mean, you, I, I, this is a kind of side commentary, but it is so refreshing to be on the incredibly chaotic streets of Bangor uh, because um, the, the, the people carry themselves in a, in a way that this feels like um, it gives me hope. If, if you're on the streets of pretty much any American city right now, it's sort of depressing. Um, you know, people don't know which end is up. Uh, not, people are not happy in the U.S. And I, I, get the, I get the impression here that people are pretty happy overall with a lot less than what we have in the U.S. And, and the trend in our government is, uh, it's not just our government. Back to the topic. I'll say aggressive mitigation, so it's not happening here. All right. uh, we can hit, switch to heat-tolerant crops. Now, like I said, um, 
uh, staple crop. So you could switch to millet and sorghum. Those, those would be better. There's all sorts of issues with that. Of course, no one in, in, in living in middle America, middle middle latitudes, knows how to grow a millet or a sorghum. And the whole system is set up to make profits for really large companies. So profits, those companies have a real incentive of keeping farmers growing <coughs> maize and soy because that's how the whole system is set up. So they're not going to encourage farmers to switch to sorghum and millet because a lot of the grain training there, like a lot of the a lot of the maize, for example, produced is not used to feed people, right? It's used to create sugar, it's used to feed animals, it's used to make ethanol. So all of this stuff is a for-profit thing to the people who actually are shipping grain around the world. And you know, you can't do that with milk. At least we don't know how to do that yet. So there's gonna be a lot of pushback, certainly in the mid-latitudes, to switching to heat to holly crops. But even in Africa, where you can grow millet and sorghum, and there's certainly uh, a knowledge there of how you do that, in particular in places like Ethiopia, um, they're switching to maize. It makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, uh, agriculturally to do that. But it's a, cult it's a cultural thing. You seem to be richer if you're growing maize and eating maize, right? But it's actually insane to do this. Okay. You can breed for improvements in heat tolerance. Like I said, this has been something that the breeders have been working on for a long time without any progress. There are new breeding techniques, marker technology, and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, the people I talk to say, like, don't hold your breath. Um, there's some papers that have come out in the last five years in wheat and just said, like, this is not going to happen in wheat. And it's probably not going to happen in maize either. Heat is such a complex trait to breed for that, um, that it's, it's, it's probably not something you want to hold your breath on. Um, 30 years of limited or no progress in wheat and maize so far. Uh, let's see what else. I think I might be done. And why am I so optimistic? Uh, uh, I'm optimistic because I don't actually think we have to go there at all. You know, I think this um, split the difference in mission denial. If you watch what's happening, it's kind of amazing. So every year I give this lecture, you know, this, this course, climate for non-science majors. And in the U.S. that means really low level of skills. Okay? Now, um, this course, I, I, there's a two weeks of it where I talk about renewable energies. And every year, I have to go back and dig into these things to get all the new statistics. And, the, for example, the investment in solar has cre increased by over 120, a factor of 120 since I've been teaching this in 10 years. Renewable energy is coming down so fast, and people are starting to see that there's money to be made in renewables, that things are switching. And if you look in the U.S., everything is designed to protect right now because they're so worried that people are going to switch. I mean, they're already switching. It's already cheap. Even in Seattle, where I live, where it's cloudy six months a year, you should switch to solar. It makes a lot of sense. You'll make a lot of money off of it. Of course, what they, in the U.S., what the Republicans are trying to do, the way you make money off in the U.S. is you put solar panels in your house. It produces power. You produce way too much more than you can use, and you sell it back to the grid. And so you're actually making money off of your own little power plant, right? And, and, this is, and people are switching all over the West Coast because of this. Now, Republicans have seen this. Actually, the electric companies have seen this and saying, oh my gosh, we're just going to be paying for the electric lines for everyone else to make money. We have, we're just going to be losing money like left, left and right because we're just paying for the electric lines. And so they put pressure on the Republicans, basically, to make it illegal to sell energy back to the grid. So there's a real conservative effort to try to slow down the renewable train. But I don't think you can. I think it's... Uh, it's gone. It's out left the station. And the question is, how quickly do we turn it around? And it probably is mm, not going to be quick enough to, certainly won't be quick enough to avoid a two degree world, but I'm sure it's going to be quick enough to avoid a four degree world, warmer world. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, but it really means that there's got to be a lot of demonstration projects that say, why is my world better because we switched to renewables? Not just like we're going to avoid a problem. It's, I, I think Al Gore told me once there's three things I know about. You know, if you want to solve a big problem, there's three things you, I know. He said, you, you need to know, um, you have to be honest to the, with the people, like how serious the problem is. And then you have to afford a solution, you have to put out a solution that really is going to solve the problem. It's not just going to solve like 1% of the problem. Of course, that's a tricky part because now you need sort of either global action or global coordination for action, which is tricky nowadays. But the third thing you have to do, which we never do, is you have to give the people a vision of why their world is going to be a better place if you do this. Right? And so that's where I think, you know, individually or as states or as cities, 
we can put out those examples and say, why is my, this community is a better place because we switched to renewables or because we made cars illegal in the center of town, so it's a really nice place to be and people want to be there. You start putting those visions out there, pretty quickly things are going to turn around. Nobody likes to live in the Delhi air pollution, right? So I think, I think we can do this. I mean, it's happening pretty fast, and, and the powers that be are trying to slow this train down, and, and I don't think they're going to be successful. Thank you again so much for inviting me down here and uh, letting me share this. Thank you. Nowadays, we are hearing a lot about vertical farming and other things, and they are supposed to be very much, uh, I mean, uh, efficient in uh, respect to water use and land use and so on. So, what is your take on about this? Uh, technological solutions that people You mean like drought resistant seed, things like that? So vertical farming. Uh, oh, vertical farming. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now, it's a pretty expensive option. Um, uh, and especially given the amount of food that we can produce, we need to produce. Um, to be, so, so, right now, we produce about one third more calories than we need to for the world. The issue today is, is access. It's like having the money to buy enough food to live a healthy life, right? So we produce about a third more than we than we need, um, and we actually we actually throw away about a third of what we produce. So you know, there's a, there's some buffer there, not enough buffer to keep you know, get us to doubling of, of what, you know to doubling what we need. But there's all sorts of other problems, uh, like especially in America, and I think it's true in Europe as well. Um, the eating habits are, you know, it's ridiculous. It's created so now for the first time in 20, in I don't know how many years, for the last 20 years, the lifespan of the people in America are going down, right? And a lot of that is because of heart problems and other things, which is related to diet and exercise. So, you, I mean, you can, you can do a lot, I think, by, and this is where, like, this is like kind of a, a Madison Avenue campaign. This is a, so how do you change the culture from people who are meeting such a, such a, poor diet, meat diet, to more of a veg vegetarian diet. I mean, you don't have to worry that here in, in India, right? I mean, if you look at the charts, India is sort of like off the charts. Down here, 15% of the population eats meat, right? But if you look in the, in terms of where you get your, your calories from, but if you look in the U.S., it's like 40%, right? So, so if you can shift that down, it means that all this grain you're now using to feed animals, you can feed people, and that's a lot of grain. And so I, I don't I don't know if you need to go there. Right now it's expensive to go there. Um, just yesterday I got news that Brazil's uh, new president Bolsonaro have decided to march the agricultural ministry with uh, environmental ministry and open Amazon for all kind of beef production. Oh, all. all kind of beef production. That's good. And, uh, yeah, got that's applaud from your president. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, oh yeah. He has something to do with that too. <laughs> Jesus, that guy gets around, doesn't he? Uh, uh, okay. So yeah. Uh, Okay, so you see what farming in the Amazon and the tropical forests do today. You get, a, you get a pretty good yield for about a decade or so, and then it just falls apart. And what happens is uh, you abandon that land. So really all you do in the end, in the short term you might get some extra grain production. It's never high yields, but you get some extra grain production. And within you know, basically a decade or so you have to abandon it. So you, what you end up really doing is just deforesting. And then you've lost, you've lost the Amazon forest or the rainforest. Um, and uh, if you actually look, there's an, an interesting pressure. So in Cambodia, there was similar arguments. But the actual interest uh, at the time was we can make a lot of money by selling these tropical hardwoods, which are really valuable. So, you know, uh, yeah, sure, give me the forest concession and we'll take this out and we'll, we'll have new cropland. Well, you really, really, and people know better. People know that basically there's going to be a short-term gain, which is going to be selling all these valuable tropical hardwoods. And then it's just going to be an ecological nightmare. Also, uh, applicable for palm oil in Borneo rainforest and all in Indonesia. Yep, big deal. So Indonesia is like that, what the third or the fourth leading uh, emitter of carbon dioxide today because of the of the slash and burns, uh, you know, and the peat fires that they have. Um, uh, there are, there are groups that are trying to slow that process down. Um, uh, palm uh, oil palm is. Um, this is not my specialty, but I, I do know that um, you know using you know I, I say in general using agricultural land for biofuels. There's very few places where uh, it's not a sin against humanity. Um, if you think about it, like anytime you're using ag 
soils, basically, um, you're going to have some loss, so some loss of quality, in, in, you know, like it, or you're going to have some runoff or whatever. And soil's not a very renewable resource. I mean, it is, but on a really long time scale. So, so I would say using any kind of soils, tropical soils, mid-latitude soils, for biofuel productions is not necessary, and is and you're losing a resource that's very valuable, the soil, basically. So especially the increasing the temperature, we can notice the decrease in yield. One side, second thing is attack of the pest on the crops. Especially we are concentrating here mostly on the rice, yeah. wheat, and maize. Yeah. In case of fruits and vegetable crops, also we can notice the decrease in the yield because of attack of the this pest. They directly go and eat the economic product. On other side, we can notice the increase in the viral diseases because in, in the what? increasing the viral diseases. Viral diseases. Viral diseases. Oh, viral diseases. Yeah. Because uh, this mainly the second pest of the vectors for these uh, viral diseases. Uh, because of increase in temperature, these second pest complete very rapidly in the life cycle. They complete more and more generations per year. Because of increase in this generation, yep. we can notice the incidence of viral diseases and more. Because of this one also, we can notice the decrease in the uh, yes. uh, yep. loss. Yep. 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 This is another side is a very important and complicated part. For this, for this one, for the management of this uh, constraint, the insects is not a good measure. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the development of resistance varieties is a good measure, especially in maize, wheat and uh, rice also. Yep. Uh, what are the strategies are followed in the USA and the others um, for the, especially this uh, strategy? In the USA, the, 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 the policy for building up resistance is you keep on producing new things that are just a little bit different and just as toxic, basically. That's the strategy. But, you know, there, there is a strategy that's, that, that's available, the integrated pest management, which has worked really well. But the thing is, you, you have to, one, one is you, you have to do the research to know what is going to work. You have to know within that culture, is this going to work? Within that economic constraints, is it going to work in this area? So, you know, part of the the yield increase in sorghum in uh, Ethiopia was was new varieties, but part of it was, was uh, integrated pest management, you know, and, and, and done in a very biological way. So I, I think there, but but that's hard. You have to figure out how how we, what collection of plants or bugs you're going to put in this place. And I, am I going to plant garlic everywhere because garlic is a really good, uh, you know, uh, bugs don't like garlic, but you know some bugs love garlic. Right? And, and it might not work and it's from certain environments. Like that. So, so, so experiments like these things are really important. In the US, we've kind of removed, we, we're no longer investing in agricultural research other than the major grains doing the traditional ways. There's very little support for um, what do you call agroecology. I mean, they're just like little fringe pockets here and there. But that does still exist in a lot of places. And these, these um, independent, not independent, these um, international research uh, Property stations are looking into some of this stuff, but it's actually, I think it's way underfunded for what we need to do, especially we're going to go to things like IPM. Sir, your study was uh, basically based on maize, uh, which is a simple plant. Uh, but, sir, uh, what about rice and wheat, which are, I mean, C3 plants? Uh, sir, because uh, in India and uh, China, which are basically Southeast Asian countries, uh, sir, the predominant crop is uh, rice. Uh, so, sir, in the perspective of climate change, uh, as one of your data mentioned, that the global uh, I mean, decrease in yield, uh, it is 19% uh, for rice as compared to 31% for maize. Uh, so, sir, don't you think that the situation is more alarming for Western countries like US as compared to India and uh, China, where the predominant crop is rice? Uh, I would say that 20% or more of decrease in any. any, any uh, agricultural grain anywhere is low alarming, you know. So 20% decrease in India is alarming. 20% right? decrease in maize. I mean, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we need to be um, terribly alarmed at any particular. Uh, that no one number is better than the last. I think if you're talking about 20% reduction in yield when you need to get to a doubling. Well, if you think of it this way, most of that population increase is in. Asia and in the tropics, right? It's not in the latitude. So, yeah, maybe we lose some re some of our production in the U.S., but we already have so much production that we export. You know, a good chunk of the maize we grow is exported more more than less than fifty percent, more than twenty five percent. So, you know, we can afford to take pretty big hits in the U.S. in terms of maize production. But the fact of the matter is, most of the world eats a lot of rice, and uh, where you're adding these next two billion people is where people eat rice. Right? And, uh, 
you know, to a large extent. So I think you have a kind of a, you know, a coincidence of th two things that are not good: increasing population and decreasing yields. Thank you. Um, so I suppose thank you for uh, uh, this wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, but and the statistics is pretty um, shocking, especially for countries like the U.S. and Europe. Uh, one of the basic things that we learn in ecology is uh, uh, diversification is the best way for adaptation, right? And uh, if you see in the U.S., like it is monoculture all the time. Yep. So you think that it's going to play a big role if the best attacks are going to increase? And is that probably that is the point that they can intervene for action, right? Yeah, so the, the monocultures that you see in the U.S. and, in, and actually in Europe and China as well, um, uh, there's so much economic structure built around those things, I don't see them changing, unfortunately. Um, you know, you, you see it in isolated instances, you know, like a, um, and you see it every once in a while, someone can escape the idea that you have to produce as much as possible and be as big as possible. In fact, my brother did escape this uh, before he retired on the farm. He went from trying to be just like a typical uh, mid-latitude farm where you just got to get bigger and bigger and produce more and more milk. And uh, uh, I can tell you his finances right now. Um, in the U.S., you know, if you're let making, as a family of four, if you're making less 40, than $40,000 a year, you're in poverty, right? So there's a, it's a different, you know, it, it's bad. Okay, it's just a different number. I don't know what it would be in rupees, but it's a, it's a, you're in poverty at that level. So he was making one quarter of the poverty level, right? And with a family of four. And uh, his, um, so he was making $10,000 a year, right? Which is way below the poverty line in the U.S. And you are hurting. I mean, he had no health insurance. He had no ability to send his kids to college. Um, uh, you know, he's, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, literally living in the wood stoves, you know I mean, like the, they, this is a pretty primitive environment. And his net income was $520,000 a year, and his, met, his net expenses were five hundred and ten. dollars So you can see the volatility here, massive amounts of money exchange in which none of it's going to him. So he just said, like, I can't do this anymore. And he said, I, I, I'm going to go back to the way my grandfather, well, our grandfather did it. And this was not because he decided, like, oh, this is the way to do it. He had a kid come in from New Zealand that lived with him and said, this is why we farm in New Zealand. He said, you know, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I can't actually be working around the clock every day of the year, milking these cows and going broke. And so maybe I'll try it this way because it was less labor intensive. So it's, it's rotational grazing. You let the cows out, they roam around, they eat, they drink, they do all the work for you, and they, give, they produce less milk, right? But they're doing all this work so you don't have to be out there with tractors mowing and, you know, and, and plowing, stuff like that. So his net income, so he trans made this transition. Not only did he have, because he didn't have to like really push the crops, so he had actually worms in the soil for the first time since we were kids, right? Because my, my, my grandfather did it, switched it to be industrial, and my uncle took it over, and my brother took it over. And then he switched it back. He said, well, as I said, he said, what's the first thing you notice? You know, like when you switch it back, he goes, well, you remember when we were kids, we saw worms in the soil? He said, and the whole time I came back here, and I've been working this farm since I, since I came back, I've never seen a worm. And now there's like worms everywhere. The soil's healthy again. So you need less fertilizer, right? So he didn't have to use any fertilizer. He didn't have to use any pesticides. He sold all of his tractors except for two. And he went, he went from making $10,000 a year to making $90,000 a year, having health insurance and sending all of his kids to college, right? And he had, to, he had time off in the summer because instead of having to bale hay like crazy and mow fields, um, the cows were doing it. Work. And so instead, in the summer, he would come out and hike with me for a week, you know, and he would take a vacation. So you, there's ways you can do this, but that's a, that's a, that transition requires help. So he had a huge amount of help from an agricultural extension um, and, 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 and doing this. So, so it can be done. It's probably not going to happen in the U.S. There's just, everything is aligned so much. And farmers in the U.S. are so in debt because they're trying to push things so hard that the first thing they do when they get a break, you know, their prices go up for the grain so they can do something. The first thing they do is they reinvest in, in machinery because they, their machinery is falling apart. They're trying to keep it together. So I think in the U.S. it's not going to happen. But, you know, a lot of big time uh, agriculture, as far as I can tell, hasn't really happened yet in India. You know, there's like 
you're not talking about dairy farms of 10,000 cows, right? You, your, your rice farms are still, I think, pretty small. Um, instead of having, you know, a thousand hectares of rice farms, they're still pretty small. So, so I think the ability to keep on using um, sort of, I want to call it heritage seeds and, and traditional practices, um, as long as you don't lose it, I think there's an ability to expand it out. But there has to be an investment by the new government to help do the research to figure out like how you move forward. So I have a question. So I was thinking you told that you know a plus two degree increase in temperature or plus four degree in mm -hmm. increase in temperature is going to reduce uh, yields of the crops. Yeah. Crops. Whereas in case of pests, you told once again the same thing. There is increase in temperature mm -hmm. plus two or plus four degree mm -hmm. Celsius yep. increase in temperature. It is going to increase the pest problem, yep. maybe because of higher metabolic yep. activity, yep. or maybe because of uh, development of resistance yep. Yep. in, in yep. the pets or in the pathogens. The same thing we can expect in crop plants also, what I feel. Mm -hmm. uh, say for example, uh, when the temperature increases one side, finally crop plants may evolve in such a way that they may acclimatize to that new change of climatic situation. Once again, there may not be a huge loss or a significant loss. Right. Once again, we yeah. can see the equilibrium once again. Yeah. So this is my thought. I want to. Yeah. From this. The thing is that. Uh, yeah. So. So what are the chances that? But the thing is that crops don't evolve, right? We put them in the ground. They grow one year. You pull them out. So it's not like the crops are in the ground saying, "I'm experiencing higher temperature, so I'm going to evolve. You know, I'm going to grow another shoot over here." It may not be a sudden change. Yeah. Over the years, maybe yeah. it may take a few hundred years. To so I think, I think, too late. yeah, it's too late, it's too late, yeah, yeah, it's too late, you need to do what this. I think, what I think, yeah. crop may evolve in such a way that they may adjust, they may acclimatize to that new situation, so that once again the loss may not be significant. So I think the new situation, which is an unknown one right now, um, other than we do know that in these experimental plots, yield goes down, okay? and, they, and they've been measuring it for 30 or 40 years, so if they have, if there's going to be some, you know, evolution, um, well, certainly, humans are controlling what, brain, what breeds are going in there. But the one place that we don't actually know a lot about, at least I'm not sure, we're pretty sure, something uh, is like, how does, this, how does the ecology of the soil change? You know, and that actually also depends on how you farm. How does that change? If you have constantly hotter conditions or wetter conditions or moisture conditions, how does the composition and the function of the soil change over time, over like a 50-year period? I, I don't think we have a good understanding that we were talking about this the other day. Um, that's a really important problem. Uh, it may be a hard problem, but there's probably low-hanging fruit because people don't actually look at soil evolution on these time scales from the, from the biological control. But that's one place where evolution may happen. It may be good, it may be bad. Right? It could be a disaster. I don't, think you wanna, I don't think you wanna bet on the fact that the soil ecology is gonna change in such a way that all of a sudden these plants that are having a hard time today under perfect conditions are all of a sudden gonna get more yields. I, I think that's a really bad bet. If, if anything, it's going to it's going to be the other way around. Because um, everything we we've done, every all the stuff over the years with the soils that we have now, I mean, it's possible that there's some magical soil out there that would be produced when the temperatures hit 50 degrees here and there's like two meters of rain a year. Possible, but I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on it. So let me conduct one other point of talk I heard about it, climate change, how it can be. Oh, thank you. Well, Tom, uh, you did mention the when the temperature increases, the yield of agriculture lessens. In addition, the protein content probably goes down. Yep. Goes down. Yep. On the contrary, looking to the health-related issues, when the climate changes, global warming increases, the allergic diseases increase yes. exponentially. Yes. That's a global phenomenon. Yep. They say it is mainly related to the increase in protein content of the pollens. Or do you kind of say pollens? Pollens, yeah. Pollens. Okay. Apart from the new weeds going up in the when after the warms up and a longer period of flowering, apart from protein content will be high in the pollens, they say. And if the carbon particle deposit on them, it will be 50 times more allergenic to So how the pollen kind of pollen is very high, the content of the yield is less. There was a little confusion I then want clarification. Okay, so I, I I'm not familiar with the the science that shows that the protein content of the pollen goes up. But it wouldn't surprise me because it's a completely different species, right? You're looking at trees and, and other plants as opposed to um, grains. So, I mean, that, that, that could be, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, it could, it could very well be. They're completely different species. They could react differently in terms of their protein response. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think uh, there are other questions you can come and ask. I don't want to hold the audience. Uh, <coughs> this one. So let's thank Professor Bhattisri for a wonderful talk and exposition, which is very relevant to India. Thank you. And the first exposition we have a few small gifts. I hope you can carry it. <laughs> oh, thank you.